Creo que no os voy a presentar al profesor Amiclin porque todos ya lo conocéis y ya ha sido muchísimo presentado. Solo quiero decirles que eh, para mí más que un compañero y uno de los principales expertos mundiales en autismo, es un gran amigo y para mí es un honor, un gran honor, tener una persona como Ami Klin entre los que puedo decir que considero como amigos. Ami Klin es una persona con una memoria absolutamente fantástica y que eh, es una, tiene, un, ¿verdad? Y tiene un conocimiento casi enciclopédico de lo que se hace todos los días. Me imagino que él pasará mitad de la noche leyendo los artículos, los últimos que han salido de, eh, sobre autismo, porque lo sabe todo hasta lo más antiguo y lo más reciente de los artículos. Pero más que un investigador y un eh, conocer de todo lo que tiene que ver con autismo, es un profesor, es un didata. Y así lo he conocido yo hace un rato de años, cuando lo hemos invitado para irse a Portugal para hacer una conferencia, una conferencia muy sencilla, que era una conferencia de 12 horas. Y así a Miklin nos ha planteado con una conferencia de 12 horas, que ha tenido un intervalo para tomarse una, una comida y, y ha continuado. Y durante ese tiempo, en la Fundación Gulbenkian, donde lo hemos recibido, él ha respondido a todas las cuestiones con la misma alegría, con la misma vivacidad y con la misma eh, segura, segur, seg, seguridad que lo ha hecho aquí con nosotros. Por eso, eh, me parece que es importante para todos aquí que eh, se si quieren entrar en el eh, campo de autismo, se puedan socorrer de los escritos, de los libros que Amy Klin es editor, y todos lo saben que en cuanto a editor de Handbook, of Autism and Pervasive de and Developmental Disorders, eh, que, que es la, la, digamos, el libro de texto de referencia de autismo. Pero además, les recomiendo dos otros. Uno de Amy Klin con Fred Volkmar y Sarah Sparrow sobre el síndrome de Asperger, y que se llama a sí mismo Asperger Syndrome, y lo más reciente de todos, sobre lo que nos ha dicho hoy, lo que nos va a decir hoy, lo que nos ha dicho ayer, sobre los niños y los bebés, y que se llama Autism Spectrum Disorders in Infants, Infants and Toddlers, y que ha salido y, y, y que es un libro que, me, que, que todos que se interesan por el autismo en los bebés es ya un libro de referencia. Además... Uh, lo digo de experiencia propia, si quieren hablar con vuestros uh, conocidos de autismo, si le quieren dar referencias, les recomiendo lo propio site de Yale Child Center, donde tienen textos, algunos de AMI, otros de sus compañeros, que son textos de introducción fantástica a lo que es la problemática del autismo y del síndrome de Asperger. Por todo eso, yo quería agradecer una vez más a Ami que está aquí entre nosotros con gran esfuerzo uh, y por amistad y por voluntad de, de, de darnos a conocer sus trabajos y lo que se sabe de autismo y por eso le hemos pedido que nos hable de lo porvenir es decir, que en su opinión cómo será la investigación en los próximos años cómo va a ser la dirección que se va a tomar para la investigación sobre Asperger en los próximos años, ¿qué, qué podemos nosotros esperar de esa investigación? Gracias, Ami. Hay un consejo a todos, que cuando van ustedes a hablar en un congreso, tener un amigo para introducirlos. Funciona siempre. Bueno, muchas gracias. Es un placer muy, muy, muy grande. Hablamos ya el, ayer. Es un placer muy grande estar aquí. Gracias por, 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 por la invitación y todo. Pero vamos a hacer así, entonces. Yo, bueno, yo voy a hablar en inglés. 
Pero después, la gente que tiene preguntas y todo, para que no se sientan así, no, no voy a hacer una pregunta, pueden hacerlo en español, que nosotros hablamos del portuñol, que es eh, <risa> más o menos parecido. Ok. Now, all of this very nice introduction um, is, uh, has a reason. The reason is that they asked me to address uh, very difficult questions. And, um, and so um, I'll try to the best of my ability to address some of, the, um, uh, some of the issues that have to do with the present and the future. Now, some of those things are not uh, uh, terrifically interesting, but I think it's important for us to, to just cover. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to, um, to talk a little bit about uh, the status of Asperger's syndrome as a diagnostic category. And then I'll try to move on to something that uh, it's closer to my heart, which is um, what do we do in order to improve the field? Um, uh, and um, what I do need is for you to remember some of the things that we talked about yesterday. Because um, when, we, uh, when we talk about uh, adolescents and adults with autism and with Asperger's syndrome, we tend to forget they were once children. In fact, they were once babies. And um, for, any, for any person who accompanies children over their lifespan, um, it would be really silly for us to try and understand what happens to individuals in their adolescence and adulthood if we don't take into consideration the fact that they have a lifetime of experiences. And what I tried to, um, to show you yesterday was that um, those experiences appear to be different. And as clinicians and as clinical investigators, we, we need to take that on board. Because if we don't realize that there is a developmental pathway and we try to take the perspective of those individuals, um, we tend to, in a way, impose our own conceptions of what to be social or about. And then we end up, in a way, misinterpreting children and we tend to understand them when we're really only understanding ourselves. And that's not very good if you're a clinician. That's not very good if you're a clinical investigator. So my title, Quo Vadis, Asperger's Syndrome, I know it's a... It's a little religious, but um, uh, the idea is to really to have a sense of where are we going with that. And so let's go back for a few moments. Um, the nosology or the classification of, the, um, of, uh, of autism and all of the related conditions, they all started with very influential clinicians. So we talk a little bit about Leo Kenner, we talk a little bit about Hans Asperger yesterday, and there were other very, very influential clinicians um, whose descriptions of some children became formalized into, the, um, into, into our nomenclature, into our uh, formal diagnostic system. Now, um, what happens is that those individuals wrote beautiful prose. They observe children, they try to be theory free, And then, uh, because those descriptions were so wonderful, they became what we now see as those conditions. And, uh, and then clinicians all over the world began to adopt those, uh, those descriptions. But, um, but people take liberties, and they use all sorts of different uh, kind of variations in order, to, um, in order to use the work of those clinicians. In the, um, in the 60s, what we saw is that uh, yet another wave of uh, very influential clinicians and investigators try to codify the prose that those pioneers created. So people like Michael Rutter, Rutter and Lorna Wing and, and Christopher Gilbert, who is uh, convalescing of knee surgery apparently, um, those individuals try to uh, come up with some statements. And those statements uh, then would uh, help uh, investigators and clinicians all over the world to, um, to make the diagnosis that they were talking about. Now, this was great, um, uh, and it was possible using those statements to, to validate conditions like autism. Uh, people, I, I think people don't, probably don't even remember that there was a big issue as to whether autism and schizophrenia were two different conditions. In fact, autism for many years was called child schizophrenia, and the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders used to be called Journal of Autism and Child Schizophrenia. Now we know that those are two very, very separate conditions. There is no sharing of genetic liabilities, and there is no sharing, in fact, of the developmental pathways. And so that was great. But then, um, uh, then there was a major development in the field of classification, because those conditions now were being formalized primarily for the reason that those individuals needed services, Uh, people were passing laws that make having a disability an entitlement, an entitlement, for example, for support, for educational programming, and so forth. 
And so, um, and so we started uh, with a new wave of uh, diagnostic manuals. So many of you know that the uh, DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, published by, the, um, by, by APA in the United States, by the American uh, Psychiatric Association. And in Europe, you have the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases. Now we are in the 10th edition. And um, what, those, what those systems did was to take the work of these uh, pioneers, people like uh, Michael Rutter and Lorna Wing and so forth, and make them formal. So now these were formalized diagnoses that were critical for the families because certainly in the United States, um, uh, having a diagnosis means that you can get access to the health, um, health services. You have entitlements by insurance as you have entitlements through the educational system. And uh, people were trying the best through those statements to approximate the gold standard. And the gold standard in our field was always the, uh, the work of very experienced clinicians, okay? And then we went on, uh, because um, now uh, we knew that uh, autism is the most strongly, among all developmental disorders, uh, the most strongly genetic of all developmental disorders. And people want to find out what was the genetic basis of autism. But for that, it was important to, uh, to, to create consortia, meaning um, uh, centers around the world, who were working with individuals with autism. And for that, we needed to, uh, to have a standardized way of doing so. And so people like Michael Rutter again, but certainly Kathy Lord and others created diagnostic instruments. And those were standardized. And I think most of you have heard about the autism diagnostic interview, the autism diagnostic observation schedule. And those instruments were created for two reasons. One, to help less experienced clinicians uh, to diagnose autism in the same fashion. And those instruments were keyed in uh, DSM-4 and ICD-10 so that now all of those centers could claim that they were uh, doing the diagnosis in the same way. And um, those things have uh, actually succeeded in many different ways. I think autism is probably the best among all psychiatric diagnoses in terms of the specificity um, of, uh, cl of, of clinician assignment or diagnostic instrumentation um, uh, for the condition. And, uh, and this is great. And yet, um, uh, uh, for all of that work, um, we have been able to take what we referred to yesterday as the autism spectrum disorders, which is the big equalizer. It's like saying, um, uh, let's take all of the different manifestations of social disabilities of early onset and let's bring them all into this cluster. Um, and indeed, to separate individuals with uh, autism spectrum disorders from those without is, um, is working very well. Now, within the autism spectrum disorders, uh, the subtypes, this is the problem. The problem is that um, uh, people still uh, use that, those diagnoses of autism, of Asperger's syndrome, and the infamous pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, or PDDNOS, uh, uh, according to ICD-10, atypical autism, in very much uh, uh, sort of uh, in, in um, let's say, informal ways. Um, and there is very, very little agreement among different centers as to how you make the clinical assignment of, uh, of those different subtypes. So, uh, so this is one thing. The other thing that has happened in our field is that um, uh, in the past 10, 15 years, uh, there has been really a wave of new neuroscience studies and new genetic studies. And uh, people really um, would like to use the diagnostic classification, those definitions in those manuals, as a way for them to study the condition from a neuroscience and genetics. Now, uh, those diagnoses, those, those definitions were not intended for that. They were intended primarily to get people to make the diagnosis and to entitle people to services. So more about that later. This is where we are now. In DSM-4TR with, with the text revision, we have basically um, uh, under the chapter of social disabilities of early onset, we have those conditions. Um, some of them may or may not imply intellectual disabilities or mental retardation, and that's autism and pervasive developmental disorders. One of them does not imply intellectual disabilities, and that's Asperger's syndrome, and there are two of them that always, always 
uh, involve intellectual disabilities, and that's Rett syndrome and, um, and child disintegrative disorder. So this is the state of affairs. And I'm not going to say much about Rett's disorder or child disintegrative disorder because those are conditions that for those who are, you know, fairly experienced, um, those are not difficult conditions to make the diagnosis. The problem is with what people really address as, as the autism spectrum disorders, and that's autism, Asperger syndrome, and, um, uh, uh, and, P and PDD-NOS. So it works well uh, uh, against uh, all of these children who have conditions other than an autism spectrum disorder within the subtypes is an issue. But there are many other complicating factors. Um, uh, in young children, for example, uh, the subtyping doesn't work. We basically don't have sufficient information or sufficient data, sufficient research to let us know what is the presentation of a person with one subtype versus the other um, in the first um, two and a half years of life. And um, that's a problem. It's a problem because um, more and more children are coming to our clinics under the age of three. And from a clinical standpoint, that's just basically fine because we can tell parents whether or not the child has a disability, what are the child's strengths, what are the child's weaknesses, and we always program individually for the child, not for the diagnosis. So this is important as service providers, that's not a problem, but for those who would like to, uh, to use early development to separate those different conditions, we can't do just that just now. And what happens in adulthood? Uh, PDD-NOS is basically uh, what my colleague Fred Volkmar would call, and this is not going to translate well, close but no cigar. Basically means that we don't know exactly what it is, but somehow it reminds us of autism. Now, when you don't have specific criteria, it becomes a catch-all. And it's actually interesting that from an epidemiological standpoint, individuals with PDD and OS are more numerous than individuals with autism. And, uh, and to separate PDD and OS from the world is difficult because we don't have a real good definition of what PDD and OS is. Now, what are the problems we have in older individuals? Uh, there are many people out there who have many different psychiatric problems. And uh, those psychiatric problems create very, uh, very complex profiles. And they will have a social disability. Uh, the problem is this. Is the social disability leading to their psychiatric difficulties or the other way around? And when we are seeing more and more adults for whom we don't have a sense of their developmental history, it becomes very difficult for us to make a diagnosis because we don't know if this is a developmental disorder of early onset. And that's what Asperger syndrome is supposed to be, right? Just like autism. So that's also a, 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 a problem. And nowadays, because adults are becoming much more aware of this thing called Asperger syndrome, who, which to some extent is also um, a, a, a complicated diagnosis because different people dif that mean different things, they want to self-diagnose. And so in our clinics, we have lots of adults who come over and they would actually like to, um, uh, to get some help and they often, um, uh, um, uh, they often have very, 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 very reasonable ways of doing so. But how do you go about um, uh, trying to understand their developmental history if they are in their 50s and there are 60s and their parents are, are, are way gone and you don't have a sense of their developmental trajectory? So that makes for very, you know, very, very, very hard clinical work. So this is one complex set of issues. Now let's go to another complex set of issues and that's um, the, the fact that um, we tend to forget that we don't have an etiology for autism. We don't know what causes autism, and very likely many things cause autism. But some of the pervasive developmental disorders, the category that bring it all together, uh, are actually etiology specific. For example, in Rett syndrome, a Rett's disorder, we know exactly what is the gene that causes it. We've known now for several years, and yet this is an autism spectrum disorder. In a fragile X uh, a syndrome, we also know exactly what causes it. We, we have a good sense of what the etiology, but that is not one of the pervasive developmental disorders. And so you ask yourself, so that was pretty arbitrary, wasn't it? That you included one genetic syndrome of mental retardation and not other. And by the way, fragile X syndrome is the most common form of mental retardation due to a genetic abnormality. And by that I mean inherited. 
It's not like Down syndrome, which is not inherited. So um, what you find out, and I'm just going to summarize this, is that there are many, many arbitrary decisions that were made when um, those uh, classification systems were made. And now we're kind of um, uh, paying the price for that. I can tell you that there are hundreds of genetic syndromes of mental retardation that we can uh, locate them in the X chromosome. Are, many of those are associated with social disabilities. Should those be also part of the pervasive developmental disorders? And nobody has an answer for that. Um, I, you may be frustrated at the end of this presentation, so I'll try to so sort of go, um, go quickly over the various different um, um, uh, sort of limitations of what we have nowadays. Now, there is a big difference between what happens in Europe and what happens in the United States. Um, in, in the United States, they say, let the diagnosis blossom. And there are individuals who have four or five different diagnoses. Autism may be one of them, and people may have others. You cannot have ADHD. You heard today DSM-4 forbids you from doing that. But the reason why it forbids you from doing that, it's not because individuals with autism do not have symptoms of, of attentional troubles or hyperactivity. It's that it's forcing people to see autism first. Otherwise, people would say that this, this child has ADHD with autistic features. And that doesn't make any sense. Autism is a much more fundamental disorder than ADHD is. And so that's the only reason. It's a pragmatic reason why people made those kinds of, um, uh, of decisions. Now, I wish that I could rely on research to tell you what is the difference between one category and another. Autism, Asperger's syndrome, and, PD and PDDNOS. But if you try to summarize that vast amount of literature for the past 20 years, uh, you probably would be just as frustrated as I am. Because when you review those articles, you have no sense of what are the children that they are talking about, except for what is the title that was used in the paper. So um, if, I were, if I was to be legalistic, like a lawyer, I, I, Every time that a person uses the term Asperger's syndrome, I will have to go to that person and say, does it mean that that person does not meet criteria for autism? Because in DSM-4, if you meet criteria for autism, you cannot have Asperger's syndrome. So I invite everybody here not to be lawyers, because that's basically too simplistic. Okay? Now, one of the problems with uh, DSM-4 is that it relies tremendously on what happens in the first three years of life. So we'll say, a child who does not have any speech delays or any language delays, um, then will have Asperger's syndrome. And the child who does will have autism. Any developmentalist, anybody who works with young children knows that there are so many different reasons why you may have language delays. And so you'd be crazy, you'd be silly to make the, the distinction between these two, these two conditions on the basis that something that is so simple as that. Besides, if you read the SM4, and I hope you don't, um, you find out that actually autism and Asperger syndrome are not mutually exclusive disorders. They're not. Because um, if you have problems in communication, and you heard a great deal about communication uh, in the past few days, um, then you meet criteria for autism. And so, um, you know, this is my, uh, my suggestion. Um, I was there when uh, the definition of autism was being created for DSM-4. The definition of Asperger syndrome in DSM-4, unfortunately, was politically informed science, which basically this was a decision that was made. It was tentative, just like ICD-10, but it took a life of its own. And that's critical. More about that momentarily. Now, uh, uh, people are discussing now DSM-5, okay? DSM-5. And uh, there are questions, for example, as whether or not Asperger syndrome is going to be in DSM-5. There are some people who would like to use the term autism spectrum disorders because they feel that this is, this is, more, um, is more valid from a science standpoint. And there are others that would like for the, for the differentiation to continue. But one of the main issues that has been fueling this discussion is, again, something quite silly. Because, again, DSM-4 is something that is critical for social policy. People may or may not qualify for services on the basis of that diagnosis. Organizations coalesce around those diagnoses. And so this is critical for the community. And yet, and yet, 
when we come up with some kind of classification, people would like to use it, for example, for clinical management, for clinical research, for brain research, for genetics research, for epidemiology, when in fact each one of those disciplines has its own sense of what is important. And there is absolutely no reason for us to believe that what works in terms of social policy should work in terms of neurochemistry and neurobiology. And so, once again, if we, are, if we are thinking about social policy, we should be inclusive. No child who needs services should be deprived of services because somebody thinks that the diagnosis doesn't apply. But if you are a neurobiologist, or if you are an, a, a neurochemist or a geneticist, you want as much homogeneity as possible in the group that you're studying because otherwise it dilutes your findings. So, um, am I making sense here? I would like to say that there are complex issues, complex issues, um, and uh, uh, those classification systems, they have worked for the, for the better defined conditions, like child disintegrative disorder, but for those conditions that we still don't know whether or not they are the same or they are different, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the state of affairs is, is a sorrow one. And um, uh, my sense is that what is going to happen in the future is that people are going to start applying classifications uh, that are more pertinent to whatever they are doing, whether it is research, whether it is clinical service, and whether it is um, uh, social policy. Um, but I think that as um, people are working on DSM-4, uh, DSM-5, and unfortunately we are part of that process, um, it's critical for us to remember that um, since the publication of DSM-4 and ICD-10, there has been major repercussions in the community. Uh, we have usage validity. I think this is a, a term that we kind of use lightly, but it's not. It's the fact that in the United States and in Europe, whole organizations, parents, have begun to coalesce around those labels. We know that. We know that the legislator, the people who actually um, make the laws that, uh, that create or does not create entitlements and resources for the community, also rely on those classifications. And so um, now we, we have a problem because we've been very successful. Um, what we know about autism and how many people know about autism now is very different than 20, 25 years ago. When I came into this field and I said that I work with uh, autistic children, they would turn to me and say, aren't they wonderful, those artistic children, aren't they? Um, autista, no artista. Uh, nowadays, you cannot buy the newspaper without reading something about autism. It's become part of our culture. This is wonderful. As those classification systems are now revised, I've been telling my colleagues that we need to think very hard because we need to make a decision here. Are we going to try and reshape the public notion of what autism and Asperger's syndrome are? or are we going to adopt usage validity? For example, um, I, I hear all the time, and I hear that particularly um, my colleagues in England and in, in, in Europe and many parts of the United States, that um, autism, uh, sorry, Asperger's syndrome is equated with autism when a person does not have intellectual disabilities. That's a lot of people use the term in that way. Or is a milder form, and you, know, you saw how Rita discussed this um, yesterday. But the fact is that, uh, you know, for many years, we knew that there is a large percentage of the individuals with autism who do not have intellectual disabilities. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, a bit of a silly, uh, a, a silly way of separating the waters. So all of that, all of that, compounded by the fact that people use the terms very freely, create a big mess. People then try to think about uh, how, to, how to use some form of a dimensional measure of the, what those conditions are. I'm not going to discuss them, but there are different ways that you can try to measure the social disability and the social ability. What I can tell you is that none of those instruments try to make a distinction between the subtypes the pervasive developmental disorder subtypes. By the way, for those of you who use the ADI and the ADAS, as you know, there is no distinction between the subtypes. You can have autism, or you can have autism spectrum disorder, or you don't have autism. So the term Asperger syndrome does not come at all in those instruments, okay? So 
What does that mean? Does it mean that we should despair, finish this talk, go home and have a nice glass of wine? No. Um, what happens is that we need to be smart. We need to know that despite the fact that um, there is a mess in terms of the classification of those conditions, those, those individuals that we work with are real. And their clinical needs are real. And um, there will be research that is going to validate or not those subtypes. But we shouldn't wait until those kinds of issues are resolved. If we are clinicians, we work with an individual. If we work with organizations, I can promise you that the work that you've been doing here, if the term at the top of that organization is Asperger's syndrome or autism spectrum disorders or autism, we are working in the same field. Okay, right now, from a genetic standpoint, from a new biology standpoint, from a cognitive standpoint, those conditions cannot be separated in a kind of in a reliable fashion. So what I say is this, we're all cousins, we all come from the same family, and we all work with the same uh, issues. And in fact, from uh, an entitlement standpoint, at least in the United States, individuals with pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, or with autism, or with Asperger's syndrome, they all qualify for services, they all entitled to the same intensity and comprehensive plan for educational treatment, and that's what really matters. Okay? How are we going to find out if those things are same or different, or does it make sense for you to use different terms to different individuals who have a social disability of early onset? Well, I can tell you that most of the research that exists now takes people um, back in time. So I see individuals with Asperger's syndrome at the age of 14 and 16 and 18, and I try to separate them from another group on the basis of what happened in their lives in the first two years of life. This is very dangerous. So what is the way to do that? Is that forget for a moment about those diagnostic subtypes. Follow the children from very early on. Think about their developmental mechanisms and their developmental trajectories, and then make those diagnostic classifications as your outcome variable. It, I think we're going to learn much more about those conditions if you see the wide range of outcomes that are associated with the things that we're focusing on, which has to do with social disabilities of early onset. And this is going to happen, I can tell you, in the next, what, three, four years. Right now, there are two or three studies that have accompanied children from the age of two to their school age. Um, in about two or three years, we're going to have 15 or 20 of those studies because they're all coming to fruition right now. And then we'll be able to know the extent to which uh, those subtypes make sense. And um, another thing that we will have to sort of uh, ent entertain is the idea that um, um, you may have a social disability for different reasons. And one way for us to better understand what happens to our children is that if we become more sophisticated in the way that we measure social disability. I mentioned yesterday that there is just too much variability. For those of us who see tens and hundreds and thousands of children, we've probably seen as much variability as there is in human nature. But it's all based on those um, very, very, very blurred uh, kind of impressions, and the diagnostic instrumentation, they are rated from zero to two. Do you want to capture the entire human nature in an instrument that measures a symptom from zero to two? For the methodologies among you, there isn't much variability there. So um, I want to spend the rest of this talk talking about this. How do we go ahead? How do we try to understand and quantify the social disability? Yesterday I talked about little children. Today I like to talk about older children, okay? Because I believed that if we start there and we follow a mechanism, we'll be able to know the entire outcome of those different categories. In this way, we'll be able to understand children. Um, before that, however, um, I just want to say this, particularly to parents, if there are parents here, and to advocates who work in organizations. Your work is critical. Don't allow the different academic discussions about the subtypes of autism to confuse you. Because those individuals, they are not the figment of your imagination. Their disability is for real. 
And for the older and for the uh, higher functioning individuals, this is just a brief list of the kinds of troubles that they have. And I'm not going to go into great detail because Rita gave a, a, a fantastic uh, presentation yesterday and she touched on all of those things. This is uh, basically just my sense of the general kinds of problems that we should focus on, the social, the communication. Uh, something that I didn't hear sufficiently in this conference was adaptive skills or real life skills. More about that in a moment. And there are organizational deficits, and this um, uh, Frankie Happe uh, covered yesterday. But also the various different obstacles to uh, adaptation that many of our children and adolescents have that become sometimes even more debilitating than their social disability. Their anxiety, their panic, those fears, depression and despondency. Many of our folks become depressed, not because they have some kind of neurobiological predisposition, because they have repeated experiences of failure. And believe me, here is one drug that has no side effects, success, and our children do not have enough. And anxiety. Yes, there are discussions in the literature as to whether or not there is a neurobiological predisposition for our children to have anxiety. Mind you, if I don't understand people out there, and I need to navigate that world every day, believe me, I'm going to be anxious. I have no control over what is going to happen in my next interaction with somebody else. I have absolutely no power to make those situations to be a little more pos positive. I'm totally perplexed by people like you. Obviously, I'm going to be anxious. And indeed, we see how those children who are more aware of others become more anxious. And how those children who become more aware that they are different, they become depressed. So it's an interesting kind of a, a, a double-edged sword there that the higher functioning individuals are those that are more vulnerable for both anxiety and depression. Okay? Now, I'm going to focus on two things. And this is uh, for the advocates. Okay? Uh, because we conducted the study um, uh, 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 because there wasn't one in the literature, and it was done um, especially for advocates so that they could go in the community and show that the individuals that they work with, that their disability was for real. And I focus a great deal on real life skills. Now, um, what are real life skills? You, we heard, for example, yesterday, that individuals, say, with Asperger's syndrome, they may have tremendous intellectual talents, okay? But it's not possible for them somehow to translate that cognitive potential into real-life skills. Now, lo and behold, life is lived on our real-life skills. Because I know too many adults who have even gone to college and have great talents, but they live with mom and dad because they are unable to do things that everybody else in the community takes for granted. More about that momentarily. And there are ways that we can quantify and measure that in a very reliable fashion. So when we, we did a little study, we looked at 115 individuals with the autism spectrum disorders. Those individuals were all high functioning. Their verbal skills, meaning their verbal IQ, was higher than 55% of the population their age. Their real life skills in the social domain was higher than 0.1% of the population their age. So if you know something about percentiles, you will be shocked. And those individuals who have uh, normative intellectual skills, those individuals, if you measure their ability to navigate the world of their peers, it was more like in the four-year range. I'm not saying that those individuals are like young children. They are not. They have big bodies. They have hormones. They have needs. They have uh, all sorts of wishes and wants. But their understanding of the other is at that level. What does that mean? It means that they're going to get themselves in trouble a lot. Okay? And the other thing that we found out is because, at least in the United States, a lot of the school programs try to make individuals with autism less autistic. They try to reduce their social disability, which is okay. Uh, but they don't pay enough, enough attention to real life skills. And you know what happens? Those two fields are almost unrelated. When we try to use real life skills to quantify the social disability, we realize that we can't do it. And you know why? Because for those individuals, their real life skills are all very depressed. That's one. So 
what is, the, what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that all of our programs should address real life skills. We cannot have an educational program without making our children more competent in the community. That's number one. Um, and, um, and, and, um, and number two, we should be aware that if we don't do so, those individuals whose talents we cherish so much are not going to fulfill their promise. Okay? So this is my political speech. And uh, it was, there was a study, it was a collaboration with Kathy Lord's group in Michigan, and, uh, and yet we needed those kinds. What, what am I talking about? This is just a list of the things that our folks, that individuals with Asperger's syndrome in adulthood can do. Personal hygiene, grooming. They don't know if they're having a big health problem or a, or a small one. They don't know much about what to, you know, how to dress themselves. And you know what? They don't know the difference between the private and the public. And so they get themselves in trouble. They have a sexual drive. You know, there is this myth that individuals with autism are not interested in sexuality. I mean, uh, it's kind of crazy. Uh, yes, they are interested. But the problem is that the same disability that you see in your clinic that um, you talk about, oh, they don't understand the others, they don't understand themselves, boy, are they puzzled by their own bodies. And believe me, because they don't distinguish between the private and the public, then something interesting happens. It comes here, it goes out here. So I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to have time. I have several uh, 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 tapes of, uh, of, of some of our patients here. But I have uh, the 16-year-old who tells me on the tape that he's been getting himself in trouble in school. And then I start sort of asking him why, and he's very depressed. And what happens is that if you observe them, he is pacing back and forth in the cafeteria. He doesn't talk to anybody until he sees a very attractive young woman. And then he goes there. And then he says exactly what is in his mind. And the reason why he got in trouble is because he tended to ask repeatedly, can I touch your crotch? Now, I don't know if this is going to translate well. Um, crotch, las partes privadas del cuerpo, no? Um, so can I touch your crotch? Now, it's OK if I'm in a school and I say, uh, can I borrow your pencil? That's fine. But I cannot go about saying, can I? So, but in his mind, it is true, isn't it? And so he doesn't see. So if you want to work with those individuals, do a little exercise with me, OK? And I think that I'm going to say that in Spanish, because I need an immediate reaction. Um, vamos a hacer aquí una, okay, un, un ejercicio, nomás para saber cómo es estar en en el cuerpo de este individuo. Now, vamos por favor partilhar todas las, eh, eh, la, las fantasías más personales que todos nosotros tenemos ahorita. Por favor. ¿No? ¿No? ¿Qué creen ustedes, la gente que está al lado de ustedes, que creen de mí? ¿No? ¿No? Well, no, of course not. We can't do that because civilization would not exist as we know it. And yet, this is the life of our patients, because he comes here and he goes there. And by the way, all of their peers, their friends, are having exactly the same thoughts. What's the difference? They don't talk about it. Okay? Other problems are uh, purchasing things, eating and cooking. I go to the houses of some of my, of my adult patients, and I see that they eat cereal every day, forever. I see that they hoard things. They, they never throw out their newspapers. So there isn't a place for them to sit down because they hoard newspapers. They don't know how to fix things. They, um, uh, they don't know how to pay bills. They don't know how to budget. Uh, they don't know how to, how to talk to, to uh, people in the position of authority. They always, you know, our folks are so honest. They always tell the truth as it is, okay? Now imagine if you are facing a police officer, the last thing in the world you want to do is to tell the truth. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yes, officer, I was driving at 60 miles an hour. I mean, you were not going to do that. And our, and our adults, they get themselves in trouble all the time. They don't know how to navigate the bureaucracies. They basically buy everything because there isn't such a thing as too good to be truth offer. They just, as we heard before, they just take it everything literally. All of those things make for a very, very difficult life indeed. And danger, danger, danger. For the past six months or so, I've been involved in three cases 
in which I was requested to go and, um, and basically advocate for an adult with Asperger's syndrome in cases of child pornography, okay? In the United States, if you're talking, if you, if you somehow are accused of child pornography, there is a mandatory sentence of five years. People don't want, you, don't want to talk to you. They send you to prison for five years. And what happened is that those three individuals who are like cavemen, okay, meaning that they don't have a social life. They are at home with their computer, and their computer is linked to the internet, and they are downloading all sorts of things. And, and they believe in those websites, and pornographic websites. They just suck you in and make you do those things. And before you know, you downloaded many, many images. Okay? If you, and then people believe that you are a sexual predator. Those adults are not sexual predators. The likelihood that they are going to commit a crime is infinitesimal. And so we need to do some form of community advocacy here. Because, yes, they downloaded images. They don't even know what they did. And one rule, don't do it, would be sufficient. And yet here we are facing those kinds of mandatory sentences. Believe me, a prison is not a good environment for our adults. They would be very, very challenged there indeed, okay? So, all of those things are, are things that we should keep in mind. Now, let's go back to the social and the communication. Um, when I mean that we really need to um, um, understand how to measure social skills, uh, we are inspired by some of the mothers of children that we work with. This is the mother of uh, the 16-year-old that I told you about who uh, was very depressed, who wanted to have a girlfriend, and he thought that he would kill himself if he ever found out. He calculated those algebraic equations that I mentioned to you yesterday, and he's also the person who gets in trouble in school. But this is how she describes uh, that, um, uh, her son, who is 16 years old. It's, I think, the most difficult part is frustration that comes when you try and explain something to a child who has no way to get what you mean except through the intellect like uh, and even that doesn't cover all the bases so it, it, it's just this little something in a person that usually you, you talk to them and, and they'll say like I'll say well um, don't say that that in front of other people because in mixed company people might take that the wrong way. Well, why? Well, they just do. I mean, it's the the topic that you don't discuss in mixed company. Yeah, but why? Yes, but why? So I go and say, I'm sorry, um, you are a very fat person. It's true, isn't it? But you cannot say those sort of things. But I want to alert you to one thing that she said that inspires us is this little something that the intellect doesn't make up for. And that's what I called yesterday intuition. Um, social, social interaction unfolds very quickly. The notion that you can test that using some kind of static instrument is, is basically unrealistic. And so these are the kinds of things that we're interested in because you remember this image. This is the image in which we show the greatest challenge for our children. Now, I'm, I'm not going to show you them, but I'm going to test you. You saw a little bit of that yesterday. But I want to know, what do you see when you watch this videotape? <coughs> and for those who know this cartoon, which is a very, very well-known cartoon created in the 40s, please don't say it to anybody. It's also my way of testing that you are awake. I'll add some acoustics for you. Oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. Not there. 
Okay, so uh, some of you were, uh, were laughing, so I assume that you're not seeing there only triangles and circles, right? Well, um, if you show this kind of a videotape to a typically developing adolescent, he's going to tell you this whole social story that is here that I'm not going to uh, tell more, but he's going to talk about bullies and being shy and scared and uh, wants to, uh, uh, standing up for the other and uh, jealous and so forth. Now, this is what an equally bright um, uh, individual with autism said after watching that, video that videotape. The big triangle went into the rectangle. There were a small triangle and a circle. The big triangle went out. The shapes bounced off each other. The small circle went inside the rectangle. The big triangle was in the box of the circle. The small I mean, it's all about geometric shapes, right? So he didn't see much beyond that. So uh, here we are. Uh, we are seeing two people watching those ambiguous visual displays. One is thinking people, and the other one is thinking things. Okay? Now, why this is important? Because there are many triangles and circles in those situations. And if I am thinking about magnetic fields and geometric shapes and whatever, and I'm not thinking about people, I'm not going to know what to do in that situation. So that predisposition is not there. Now, were I to define the problem, those individuals would solve them with no, no problem whatsoever. But the issue is that in real life, you don't solve problems. You need first to identify the problem to solve. And that's when our uh, patients have difficulty with. And besides, those creatures in the United States, it doesn't know, those creatures don't exist in Europe. But those creatures are in the schools, and you need to know if they are friends or they are foes. If they are coming to help me or they are coming to hurt me. And in order for me to do that, you need to have a predisposition to worry about people's minds. And believe me, uh, we are, most of us are really obsessed with what goes in people's minds. I'm very, I mean, I'm looking at all of you. And I want to know, uh, did I talk too much? Did I talk too little? I mean, am I keeping you awake? I'm actually looking at everybody, and I'm obsessed about your thoughts. We all are obsessed with other people's thoughts, because you are important in my life, and we are important in one another's life. Our folks are not thinking about other people in that fashion, and so they get themselves in trouble. And this is something that has been going on, as I was able to show you from very early on. So you need to remember that those individuals have a lifetime of atypical experiences. Okay? Now, um, some people would say, oh, the problem with that particular kind of stimulus that you created there, that you used, it's because they cannot bring all of those little fragments into a coherent whole. And that it's true. For many, many of our children, they see a lot of fragments in the world, and they don't bring them together into gist and context. That is true. But that is not to say that they are incapable of doing things if it falls in their area of interest. So this is a 38-year-old man who gave me this kind of narrative for that videotape. Small equilateral triangle. He talks about geometric shapes. But when I showed him this, um, um, uh, 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 this animation, I'll let you watch it a little bit. It turns out that this animation is more complex than that. And a lot of the people that I showed, that particularly uh, female research assistants, uh, did not know what this was. But that gentleman gave me the very best narrative. Finally, one person got it right, and that was the person with autism. So it's not that they cannot bring fragments of the world into a coherent gist. It's not like that. If it falls within their experience and within their interests, you see them doing even better than others, which is what is part of my bias and my message, that in autism, we often see that the issues are really in the social domain. Now, um, you heard me saying that thinking about uh, looking, at, looking at people is thinking about people, right? And I can see, hopefully you saw here, that um, our individuals are not necessarily thinking about others. We need to remind them of that. So as you saw me doing this yesterday with two-year-olds, I've always been interested on what is the world like for our adolescents and adults when they are looking at this world. Are they, are they looking at people in people's faces or they are counting light fixtures? In fact, um, um, I, I, because yesterday everybody was talking about Ross Blackburn, right? Uh, the adult with autism from England. Um, I was presenting some of the things that I'm going to present to you uh, here today, and she raised her hand 
And she asked me a question. I'm going to tell you what that question was. So this is what we do. We stand behind people's eyes. Now, this is the speed of social interaction. So here is a movie, OK? And this is, is that a way that we can dim the lights a little bit, just in case, so that people can actually see those lights? Hay una posibilidad de poner las luces un poquito para que la gente pueda mirar y ver qué es. ¿Se pueden? Gracias. Um, so here we are. So here is Richard Burton and here is Elizabeth Taylor. And they are engaged in this social interaction. They are fighting each other. Oh, gracias. Más un poquito. Perfecto, pero no me van a dormir, ¿ah? Huh? Um, okay, so here's Richard Burton and here's Elizabeth Taylor. This cross tells you where a typical adult is looking at, and this cross, the black cross, tells you where an adult with autism, with not one, but two graduate degrees, is looking at in that particular scene. Oopsies. Was that too fast for you? That's the speed of social interaction. So let's watch it now, slow motion. So what happened? This is what happened. Um, he breaks the bottle, and uh, the typical viewer goes straight here. The individual goal with autism goes alongside, is going to focus here. OK? Uh, very quickly now, take your hand. Focus on this individual. He's frightened. Cover the upper part of his face and then cover the lower part of his face. And tell me, where is his emotion? Is it in the eyes or is it in the mouth? OK. All right, for the, lady, for the um, lazy among you, um, so here it is. Um, <laughs> the mouth is pretty expressionless, but you see that the emotion is in the eyes. In that split second, my friend with autism here missed a very, very important cue of that interaction. And if you watch him, watch uh, those, kinds, uh, uh, those kinds of, uh, uh, of scenes. This is the typical viewer going from eye to eye to eye to eye. Now let's have a look at the viewer of autism. I hope. Well, this is the typical viewer. Uh-huh. I didn't put the view of autism there, so you have to take my word for it. But he went from mouth to mouth to mouth to mouth. Oh, there it is. Can you see? So, um, so we, we start thinking about this. Why um, I'm so interested in people's eyes? Because our reaction with our eyes is something that we don't think about. If there is something important happening out there, we go immediately to it. And that uh, there is no lying here. And we thought of bringing Bill Clinton to our lab, but there is no need for eye tracking there. OK? Now, um, how, um, how difficult um, is, uh, or how little, uh, how subtle those kind of phenomena are. So you see what is happening here. There is a passionate kiss on the foreground. Where is the adult autism looking at? Sorry. Right here. The light switch, right here. So again, it's missing something that is actually happening in that scene. Now, when I was showing those things that Roz um, sort of, uh, and she told me, I, uh, uh, Roz Blackman is this lady of autism, and she said, stop it. I can't watch those clips. And I asked her, why? Because of the door handle. The door handle? You know, I've seen those clips quite a few times. I never uh, saw a door handle. There is a door handle. Yes, and she paid attention to it. And she missed something really quite crucial in um, uh, those kinds of scenes. Now, this is something that we found out, that the more individuals focused on objects, the more disabled they were. Now, what was interesting to us is that those adults, and they're all high-functioning adults, um, uh, the, the more they focus on people's eyes had absolutely very little correlation of what happened to them in real life which means that maybe they haven't quite acquired the language of the eyes. They're not getting that information. But this is what was really surprising. The more they look at mouths, the more able they were and the less disabled they were, which is kind of unusual. But I told you yesterday, those are individuals for whom language is the bridge to life. So they are focusing on the mouth because this is what language is coming from. So in many different ways, they are playing that game. Now, I'll, I'll just show one more situation and I go on. 
Um, do you see what is happening here? This lady is married to this guy. This young guy is visiting the house. And she is flirting, flirting with the young man. Her hand is in his knee. Okay? So let's watch now the, uh, a typical viewer watching that scene. Okay? I'm sorry. We're going to view the viewer of autism first. So the viewer of autism is paying attention to what she's saying. Now, the young man is going to start talking and he's going to focus on that the young man is saying. Now, the typical viewer, whoopsie, what is that hand doing there? And what is the reaction of the husband? Oh, you know, oh, oh my God, what is going to happen? We see, if you follow that scene, it's almost like you can read the person's mind. And if you follow that scene, that's what you end up with. I know here is the person with autism focusing on what the man was saying, very nice glass and bits and pieces of Elizabeth Taylor. Okay? <laughs> now, here is the typical viewer going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And what you have is this very heavy triangle, which is exactly the meaning of that scene. So this is complex stuff. Um, and my final example, um, do you know when children acquire the ability to follow somebody's pointing? between 9 and 13 months, okay? Remember that piece of information. In this scene, the young man is saying, who made that picture? And he points there, okay? Now, this is what the typical viewer does, and this is what the viewer of autism does. Um, I'll use this because it's easier. The typical viewer go, hears the question, goes to the man, and follows the pointing, scrutinizes the right picture, and goes back for the reaction. This is what the viewer with autism did. He heard the question, he understands the question, but he doesn't follow the pointing. He almost goes like, which picture, which picture, which picture, which picture, which picture? So he failed to follow a, 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 a cue that 9 to 13 month olds do. If I was in this room and I said, a terrorist, you know, you would run in that direction. My friend would run right there. In real life, you need to pay attention to those things. And our children are missing all of those cues. Our adults are missing all of those cues. And then we go and treat them, and we provide them with scripts. They will work, just like Rita was saying. They will work if you are interviewing them in a very structured way, and it's basically a little variation over the script. But this is what their life is about. And we need to be able to capture that. And that's how, what I'm going to do. I'm going to skip all of that, and I'm going to go straight into that. Because life is lived on moment by moment. Life is lived in such a way that I need to focus on you, your facial gestures, what you're saying to me, but not only you. I need to pay attention to her because she is laughing at you, she is mocking you, so she's probably also mocking me. Which basically means that in order for me to understand social reality, I need to take all of those things at the same time and quickly. That's what social reality is about. And so, we have to come up with a way of capturing that. So here's a complex social scene. I mean, aside from enjoying it, having fun, I appreciated it. Everything, meeting everyone, getting introduced around, the way you had us put up out at the inn until our place is ready. Mama, I was teaching in Kansas. You won't believe it, but we had to make our way all by ourselves. This is my favorite movie of all time. It's called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And, but do you see what is going on? You need to pay attention to people to understand what is going on. So um, the problem is that there basically there is no technique for you to measure a visual scanning for a group of individuals. And we have to come up with a way of measuring that. Because everything that I showed you yesterday and everything that I'm showing you today, it's basically static. We summarize what people did for a period of time. And we need to have group measures of what happens when people are watching a naturalistic social scene. And so we have to come up with a method. And basically, we conceptualize that in terms of how much visual resources we are committing to parts of what we see. Say, for example, for parts of a screen. And we use a neuroanatomic model that I'm not going to bother you with. You just need to know that if something is really important, I'll make it happen right in front in, of my field of view because I get a lot of resolution. If I am watching something that has happened here, it's all very blurred. 
Okay? And that happens at the level of acuity, and it happens at the level of ganglion cell topology, which is the little thing that takes the image from your eye to your brain, and it happens at the level of cortical magnification, which basically means how much of your brain is devoted to a little piece of your visual field. Okay? So, um, this is now the model, very quickly. Uh, this is a little bit of the screen that you were looking at when I was showing those movies. And this is basically a mathematical equation that captures how much I devote to that little piece of the screen and the fact that I, soon enough, you know, right around it, I start seeing things as it blurs. Okay? Just remember that. Here is an eye-tracking coordinate, which is exactly where the person is looking at into that screen. And here you have about 12 individuals watching a movie. Okay? Each one of those dots is a person watching that movie. Okay? Sometimes they are watching different pieces of that screen. Um, and what, now what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take that equation, and I'm going to have one viewer, and then two viewers, and then three viewers, and those equations now are adding. So, the more you're seeing those colors that are hot, like yellow and red, the more convergence there is into what the group of people are looking at. When there is no convergence, everybody is somewhere here, you have blue colors. When people are looking at the same place, you have the hotter colors. We're basically watching that video through the eyes of about 12 individuals, okay? So, this is the model. And uh, this is our mountains. Each one of those is an, is an equation capturing one viewer and the amount of visual resources devoted to that piece of the screen. Here is the movie. And now I'm going to turn this around. Now you're seeing from the top, this is the bird's eye view. Now there is a lot of dispersion, which basically means that there's nothing really important happening on the screen that is making everybody focus on the same thing, okay? And now, they are beginning to converge and converge. And now you see some red colors, which mean that at that moment in time, in that piece of the screen, something interesting happened, okay? And now you're going to watch an entire video with that display. Now you are watching that video through the eyes of about uh, 15 individuals. Whenever there is a hot color like yellow and red, it's because something important happened on that moment in time. Okay? That's the idea. And now I'm actually going to translate that into black and white so that you can see a little bit about what they are finding very exciting. So the things that you can see more clearly are aspects of that unfolding social scene that a whole group of people were finding interesting at that moment in time in that particular piece of the screen. Okay? Now, let's have a look. We have to create some statistics here because we are American and because um, um, uh, we have to use this numerically. And so here there is dispersion. And so we create a statistical equation that allow us to take this whole group of people. And here you have a whole dispersion, what people are doing. Imagine this funnel, okay? Nothing is important, it's very dispersed. And here you have time. Each one of those squares is a frame of video that are 30 frames per second, okay? Remember that we are trying to capture something as complex and as fast changing as social interaction. Okay? So here we go. In this moment in time, there is a lot of dispersion. But here, there is a great contraction. And this is for typical viewers. So something very special happened there at that exact moment in time. You want to know what it was? I'll show you momentarily. Remember what I told you here? Okay? Now you're going to see those funnels of attention unfolding as you watch that particular movie. Do you see? So that funnel is telling you in this whole movie, moment by moment, what is important and what isn't important for a whole group of people. Can you see? And 
as you do this kind of research, what you realize is that people don't react to things as much as they anticipate things. So in many different ways, we see what we want to see. We have an internal narrative that allow us not only to capture what is happening there, but we expect it to happen there. Now imagine that our children, they don't do either of those things. They are not reacting to those fast changing signals and they don't have a narrative, a social narrative of what is happening in front of them, okay? So we create those, those forms of statistics and this is what happened in that particular funnel. This blue tells us what the typical folks were doing. In that moment in time, there is tremendous convergence on the eye. And what you see in those other colors is what the individuals with autism were doing. And at that particular space time, a frame of video, this is what was happening. And I'm not going to bore you with that, but when we use those measures, and those measures really capture not only what people were doing at that moment in time, about the entire video, those measures become much more powerful ways of quantifying their social disability and bring us much and much closer to what social adaptation is about. Now you may ask, very nice, these are adults, but would you expect that to happen in very young children? So let's move on. Now you're going to watch, uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf for toddlers? You're going to watch peer scenes, their friends playing in the sandbox, okay? Now these are now typical two-year-olds watching this movie. <laughs> Do you, see, do you see how much convergence there is in the way that these two-year-olds are watching the same video? Uh, the one thing that was really surprising to us is to find out that we all tend to be collectively drawn to very similar things. In fact, we are drawn to those very similar things from at least the age of two years. Okay? Now, let's compare two-year-olds with autism with the typically developing two-year-olds. I'm going to do that in slow motion for you, okay? And this is one representation that you have here. Remember, hot colors means that they're all converging, and when they are not converging, you see the blue colors, and this is what they are focusing on. So let's take one little scene from that movie. These are the, the typically developing two-year-olds, and here are the, the, uh, the two-year-olds with autism. You see where they are? They are here. You see what they are? They are here. They are in that door. The action is happening between these two little children, and yet the two-year-olds are focusing on that door, opening and closing, and opening and closing. Another scene? How come those two contractions are very similar now in that particular scene that you just saw because all you had was a door opening and closing they are all fine they are no longer fighting they are reconciling now these are the two year olds the typically developing ones where are they focusing on on this cue the whole scene is about that. You see where the, t the children with autism are? They are all over the place. They are all over the place. So at that moment in time, they are unable to focus on that. So um, that's why we did what we did yesterday and that we did today. Uh, we have a feeling that with those kinds of measures, we're coming closer and closer to capturing what their lives are really about, which is their challenges in understanding the world as it happens in real life. And we need to know that they have a lifetime of experiences that have been atypical if we want to do something about it. And we want to understand the range of outcomes in this uh, population. We need to be a little smarter in measuring their social disability. And hopefully I was able to show you a little bit about that. So um, what do we expect in the future? What we expect in the future is that there is going to be better instrumentation. There will be better quantification. 
there is there's going to be a better way, a more sophisticated way of even conceptualizing social disabilities so that we don't have the silliness about is this same or different on the basis of criteria that, that are too blurred, that they, they are too general. We need to be much more specific. And I would argue that not only we need to be specific, we need to be more specific, more scientific, and closer to where life is really about. And their real lives happen, not when they come to our clinics and we are engaging them in this one, one, one interview. Their real lives is in their classroom. It's in the supermarket. It's in the community. So our more scientific measures need to mirror what happens in their reality, not what we would like to do with that reality, which would be just abstracting and simplifying. Abstracting and simplifying is not going to do the trick. Thanks to our sponsors, and thanks to my colleagues and to the children and families that have participated in all those steps. Thank you. Well, well, thank you really very, very much, Ami. I think the presentation was quite self-explanatory, so uh, even if there's questions, I think we can just keep on reflecting. And, then, uh, and also because, for sure, Ami and all of us are rather tired, so I think it's time to give the... the the place to the families and to the associations of parents that provided this meeting and that are uh, in the front line for the defense and for the help and with us together uh, to go ahead with the, all the, well, let's say, uh, everything that is possible to increase the quality of life of the children youth and adults with Asperger syndrome and autism spectrum disorders. Thank you very much once again.